stream or on the recording. Um, we make this tool available. We're delighted to make this tool available to you. If you happen or not able to be here or if you teach another class during this time, uh, we, we are very glad that you have this tool available. However, if you're a member of Cornerstone and, and uh, you've tended to make the uh, recording or the live stream a replacement for actually coming to Sunday School, uh, I do want to urge you not to do that because uh, your physical presence really does matter to us. All right, so actually being here with the body is a very important part of growing in the Lord. So I just want to urge you, if you've tended to think in that direction, I'd like to arrest that right now and try to turn that around uh, so you can make it a plan to actually be here if you're able at all. Of course, if you're not a member of Cornerstone and you benefit, uh, we're delighted that you, you're able to benefit from this recording. Uh, but we, we do hope that you're plugged into a local church somewhere where you're gathering regularly with uh, members of a local body. So we're going to look today at Christ, the last Adam. And uh, this is in an ongoing study through uh, the major ideas of biblical theology where we've, we've looked at how the, the major covenants of the Old Testament frame the story. And now we're looking uh, this week and the last couple of weeks at how Christ brings those covenants to fulfillment. And so we saw uh, two weeks ago how Christ, the son of David, uh, and son of Abraham fulfills the promises made to both David and to Abraham. Last week, how Christ, the mediator of a new covenant, uh, brings that covenant into being and also brings the old covenant that was given through Moses to its fulfillment and thus its end. And then today we're going to look now how Christ fulfills the original covenant that was given to humanity in the beginning when God created man. Uh, so we'll be talking about Christ, the last Adam. We're going to begin by reading from Luke chapter 4. So if you turn with me to Luke 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. Luke tells us, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Let us pray. Our Holy Father, we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit this morning to understand your word and for the Spirit to seal its truth upon our hearts that we may behold the glory of Christ and be equipped to follow, serve, and fulfill the commands given to us through Him. We pray this in His name. Amen. I remember when I was in college, and I, I was reading um, for a class Millard Erickson's book on uh, theology, and uh, he raised the question, could Jesus really have been a man, a truly human person, if He never sinned? Because isn't it, Human, isn't it only human to sin and to fail? Don't we have that saying, to err is human? Uh, and in what sense then could Jesus really have been one of us if He never experienced failure, sin, or, or any kind of imperfection? Uh, Erickson's answer was actually quite insightful. It's the first time I'd ever heard this uh, in college. He actually said, on the contrary, Jesus represents humanity better than any of us do. Jesus, 
by never sinning, actually does what human beings were supposed to do, which is love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbors as ourselves. This is what God created us to do. Uh, if you've experienced throughout your life only computers that didn't work well, uh, you never had actually used a computer that worked right, and one day you get a computer and it actually works right, are you going to say, well, this can't be a computer. It doesn't work right. I mean, it, it doesn't work wrong the way computers are supposed to work wrong. Uh, that's similar to the problem we're facing here. Just because something's common to our experience doesn't mean it's of the essence of who we are. Just because we're all sinners doesn't mean that's the way we're supposed to be. So uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, theological insight there to, to note that Christ actually is a better representative of the human race than any of us are. And this speaks to the issue of Christ as the last Adam. If, if Adam represents humanity as it was designed in the beginning, Christ now represents humanity restored as it always should have been if it had fulfilled its purpose uh, in the beginning. In uh, Genesis 1.28, God gave to Adam and Eve uh, what is often called the cultural mandate. We talked about this several weeks ago where God uh, commanded Adam and Eve in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and <laughs> subdue it. And I argued several weeks ago that that means that Adam and Eve are to fill the earth with God's image bearers, their offspring, who are to rule over, who are to mediate God's rule over the earth, and in doing so, spread the boundaries of the Garden of Eden to encompass the whole earth. In other words, the whole earth is to become God's dwelling place. You know, Adam and Eve dwelled in the garden with God. Uh, the whole earth is to become a temple unto the Lord where He dwells with man forever if Adam and Eve had fulfilled this cultural mandate, this command. Uh, now, of course, we know the story how Adam and Eve failed to do this and are instead of able to spread the, the garden, they're driven out of the garden. And so the plan from the beginning, you might say, fails. But uh, my argument has been, and is going to, to, to come to fruition today, though it fails in the beginning, God actually never abandons that plan to have a creation that is filled with His image bearers who are mediating His rule over creation so that it becomes a temple, a dwelling place unto the Lord where He dwells with man forever. That is still God's ultimate goal for creation. So with Adam having failed in that task, we're going to see how Christ now undoes Adam's failure and even surpasses it. In fact, I'm going to make two points today as we look at four passages in the New Testament. Uh, the first point is simply that, that Jesus' redemptive accomplishment far surpasses the effects of Adam's fall. Jesus' redemptive accomplishment... far surpasses the effects of Adam's fall. We're going to look at uh, three passages that demonstrate this point, and then one that demonstrates the second one. But the first one is the one we just read, Luke 4, 1-13 where we note here there are some Adam ideas that are picked up in this story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. First, notice that Jesus is tempted by the devil, and in the first temptation, He's tempted specifically with regard to food. Does that sound familiar? Adam and Eve in the garden, tempted by the devil with regard to food. Uh, another idea that comes out is that Jesus is called by the devil here, Son of God. He says in verse 3, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And uh, he says it again in verse 9, calls Jesus the Son of God. Luke had just written at the end of chapter 3, and keep in mind there are no chapter divisions when Luke is actually writing this. Those are added later. So he, he's writing one continuous narrative. And at the end of chapter 3, if you go back up to verse 38, where Luke is, is in the process of giving a genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam. So he's saying Jesus was the son of Joseph, son of, and, and he goes on and on and on. He gets all the way back here, verse 38, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Adam being called here a son of God in the immediate context, therefore connects Jesus being referred to as son of God 
uh, as one who's fulfilling the role that Adam was originally given. But notice how they're contrasted here. Christ is not only presented as a new Adam figure, but uh, he's actually contrasted with Adam in at least two ways. Uh, one way is that Adam was tempted by the devil in paradise. He had everything he could have ever wanted in the Garden of Eden. I can imagine Adam had not fasted for 40 days when he was tempted by the devil. He and Eve were tempted. They were, they were full. They were satisfied. They had everything they could possibly want. And yet the devil brings temptation into that situation. And of course, the, the major difference in the two stories is that Adam failed, whereas Jesus succeeded. Uh, he faced down the devil's temptation uh, much longer. He, he experienced the full measure of temptation, but uh, never gave in. And so Jesus overcame a much greater temptation than Adam ever did. The last Adam succeeded where the first Adam had failed, but he far, far surpassed uh, what the first Adam had done. Another passage that speaks to this issue would be in Romans chapter 5. So turn with me to Romans 5. We're going to look at 12 through 21. And uh, we don't have time to do a thorough investigation of this passage today, but I want to give you the gist of what it's saying. Uh, notice... As we read through this passage, we look through this passage, notice that one of Paul's key ideas is this idea of much more, much more, or an equivalent idea. We're going to notice that as we go through. Uh, look at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, you would expect, therefore, Paul to immediately say, so also... Righteousness came into the world through one man or something like that. You would expect if you begin a just as, you're going to have a so also at the end of that sentence. And actually Paul doesn't do that. Um, he ends up breaking off his comparison for a couple of paragraphs, actually. He's, he's going to stop to make a qualifying point and then make another qualifying point and then finally get back to his comparison in verse 18. So uh, this is how Paul writes sometimes. It's it, uh, it can drive you crazy trying to follow it, but, uh, but this is what he does. So he's, he's just said that, that sin came in the world through one man, death through sin, de death spread to all because all sin. Now he's going to qualify that or at least explain a little bit of, of how that can be so. The question might arise, how is it fair that all people are under the penalty of death for sin if not all people have received the law of God? Uh, isn't the law what spells out the penalty of death? And if not all people have received that law, how can the penalty of death justly be applied to all? So Paul's going to make an observation that demonstrates his earlier point that all died because all were under sin. Look at verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. So so before the law is given, from the time, you might say, from Adam to Moses, there's sin in the world. People are sinning, obviously. Remember the flood story? Um, there's, there's lots of sin going on, but that sin is not counted if there is no law. Now, in, it's pretty clear that the sin indeed was counted. Remember the flood story? Judgment upon the world. Uh, in fact, Paul goes on to make the point, verse 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. When Paul uses that word transgression of Adam, he's speaking of a, a particular sin that violates a revealed specific command of God. So Adam committed a transgression in the garden when he violated a known revealed command. Uh, but the, the sins that followed Adam, at least until the time of Moses, were not like that sin. They were not, or not like the transgression. They were, they were sins, but not explicit transgressions. How is it then that uh, all men died if sin is not counted where there is no law? I think Paul is, is making the point and implying here that there's something to do with the way all of us are, are related to Adam that puts us... If, even if we're outside of the revealed law of God, still puts us under the law. Uh, and he's alluded to this earlier in chapter 2 where he speaks of the law written on our hearts, that even those who don't have the law, 
still have it written on our hearts. So what Paul seems to be saying is that there's a covenantal structure by which we relate to God through Adam, our head. And this covenantal structure is what grounds our accountability to God. Even if we don't have a revealed law, we still have that written on our hearts because of our relation to Adam. And so our sins are still counted even outside of the uh, explicit command of the law. That's probably the most thick and difficult section uh, of this paragraph. But, but Paul is making a qualification there before he goes on in his argument. I'd like to skip over verses 15 to 17 for a moment and go down to 18 and 19 where Paul actually does resume this comparison. He says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. This is a comparison. Uh, Adam and Christ are alike in this way. Uh, they're similar in the fact that they both stand as covenant heads of humanity whose actions determine the destiny of those who are under them covenantally. So all history can be summarized under these two men, Adam and Christ. And we belong at the final judgment either to Adam or to Christ. We relate to God either through Adam or through Christ at the end of the day. Now, that's the comparison. That's how they're similar. And uh, by the way, some have argued uh, in, in light of more recent uh, scientific discoveries and discussions about um, evolution and, and scientists, many are arguing today that, um, that the human race could not have descended from a single pair of uh, individual human beings. There are many Christians now who are saying that, that uh, Adam is not necessarily a historical figure. He's, a, he's a, an archetype, you might say, or he's, a, he's a, a literary figure who represents humanity itself and its fallenness. My response to that is simply to say, if, if Adam's not a historical figure, Paul's argument in this passage collapses entirely. Paul's argument doesn't make any sense to say that just as sin entered the world through one man, so justification and life come through one man would seem to demand the actual parallel of the one man to the one man. Uh, if, you, if you have over here one man who's really just a symbol of all men, then he doesn't really form a very good parallel to Christ. And then what prevents us from saying, you know, Christ isn't really a historical figure either. Uh, he's just a symbol of whatever you want to call it, humanity raising itself up or whatever. Uh, Paul's argument clearly presupposes the historicity of Adam as a, a, an actual figure who lived in history. Uh, that was both redundant and repetitive, just to make my point. All right, so, so Adam and, and Christ are similar in this regard, but they're also different. They're very different according to Paul. Look at verse 15 to 17. But the free gift is not like the trespass. How so, Paul? For if many died through one man's trespass, much more, there's that idea, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. What, what does the much more communicate? I think it communicates something to this effect, that if Adam started innocent, let's say he's at zero on the number line, and he sinned and he plunged us down to negative ten, the much more would indicate that Christ, having redeemed us, didn't just bring us back up to zero. He took us all the way up to positive ten or positive one hundred or a thousand or a million, whatever you want to say, but it's a much more quality to what Christ has done. So, so Christ's uh, redemptive accomplishment, as I say, it overcomes, it far surpasses the effects of Adam's fall. He goes on to explain further in verse 16. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass, just, just one single trespass, brought condemnation for all men. All of us, remember, as I said, are related through Adam as covenantal head. So his one trespass grounds uh, our guilt before God. But, Paul goes on to say, the free gift following many trespasses. So how many trespasses had been committed by the time Christ came on the scene? Uh, multiplied 
billions and trillions and trillions of trespasses because the law had been given and humanity's rebellion had been uh, further defined by the giving of the law. So, so uh, how many trespasses, many, many, many trespasses have been committed and yet the, the free gift came after all of those and brought justification to all who are in Christ. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, here it is again, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And you see this idea come out again in verse 20. Paul says, now the law came in, why? To increase the trespass. So the law given through Moses, explicitly revealed commands of God, increases the trespass by making all those sins that were committed before that now clear violations of revealed will. So they're now trespasses. But, Paul goes on to say, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And in the, in the Greek, he uses terms that sound similar, so it could be translated like this. Where, where sin abounded, grace superabounded. Uh, so that he goes on to say, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus does not simply restore us to a state of innocence, like Adam was in the garden. He glorifies us, making us what Adam would have become if Adam had obeyed. Another passage that speaks to this issue is 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 49. And uh, we just finished a series of sermons through this very chapter, so uh, this should be fresh on our minds. Lee has given us a great uh, overview of the teaching of this passage. I just wanted to draw out one observation from these verses that, that ties in with what I'm saying here. Uh, if you look at verse 42, you'll recall from our, our sermons through this, Paul is writing about the resurrection of the dead and, and specifically about the nature of the resurrection body here in this passage. Uh, notice in... Uh, in verses 42 and 43, he's going to give a contrast between the body as it dies and the body that is raised. He's going to say there's different qualities for one and the other. So he says in verse 42, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So you've got perishable, dishonor, weakness characterizing our present bodies that die, imperishable glory, power characterizing the body as it will be raised. Uh, so this is a, a basic contrast, but now notice how these two contrasts become focused on two specific words that Paul uses in verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, um, I think it's important for us to understand the actual Greek terms Paul uses here because the next verse is going to make an important point that draws on these Greek terms. So, um, the Greek term that means natural here is the term uh, sukikos. And the, the Greek word suke means typically translated soul. So it's, a, it's a strange term, but it's, it's an adjective that, that we might translate soulish. Uh, it's just uh, strange to, to human ears to hear that, to English ears, I guess, to hear that. But uh, Paul, the, the ESV, I think, wisely uses a word that we're familiar with, natural. But, but it's a term that has a clear resonance with another term Paul's about to use. When he says spiritual here, uh, it's the Greek word pneumatikos which also ties with another term Paul's about to use. So if you look at the very next verse, Paul says this in verse 45, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the first Adam, when it says, The first man, Adam, became a living being, the, the actual Greek word Paul uses there, which is taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is suke, which is why in some English versions, uh, Genesis 2-7, which Paul is quoting from, actually will, will often say, man became a living soul. 
So what he's doing here, he's connecting this idea of natural with, with Adam as a living soul or suke. So suke cost ties to suke. And then when he says the, the, the last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, of course, he uses that same word pneuma here to refer to this. So what he's doing is he's quoting from the Old Testament to show that even when Adam was originally created, even before Adam sinned, he still had a body that was sukikos or natural in its characteristics, even before his sin. Now, that doesn't mean that Adam was corrupt even before he sinned, and I don't think it means that Adam would have died before he sinned. Uh, death clearly seems to be the, the penalty for sin, but I think what it means, at the very least, is that Adam is at least corruptible, if not corrupt. He, he's not corrupt, but he is corruptible. His body is not, in, in other words, glorified, even before the fall. Uh, he is not glorified in the the final sense of the term, but Christ is. Christ is a life-giving spirit. And, and Lee pointed out very well that, that spirit here and spiritual doesn't mean immaterial. doesn't mean um, not physical at all. What it means is under the power and control of the Holy Spirit, belonging to the new age when the Holy Spirit is the, the dominant force. So, so Christ, when in His resurrection, receives the body that is spiritual or, or belonging to the age to come in the Holy Spirit, whereas Adam didn't even have that before he fell. So Christ has raised us up to a level that is higher than what Adam had when he was originally created. Uh, if you go on to read verse 46, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. Then verse 47, he's going he's gonna to switch terms here. Instead of saying um, natural and spiritual, he's going to say earthly and heavenly. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven." Uh, so the, the earthly body that Paul is, is characterizing here is the body that's perishable, that is corruptible, and that in our sin ultimately does die. But the heavenly body is imperishable, glorified, pertains to the age to come. And that's the body that Christ has received, and that's the body that we too will receive when we're raised with Him. So when we are raised, we surpass where Adam and Eve were uh, in the Garden of Eden. One last passage I want to look at, and that brings us to a second point here. Uh, Jesus' redemptive accomplishment results in the fulfillment of the cultural mandate. Jesus' redemptive accomplishment results in the Fulfillment of the cultural mandate. And remember, I'm talking about this, what God originally commanded Adam and Eve to do. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So, so uh, as, as uh, Lee often draws with the globe and the man, Adam, but the ultimate goal of that is that we would have a globe with a covenant head of humanity, but it would be filled with glorified human beings ruling over creation, mediating God's rule over creation. God's uh, dwelling place has now become the whole creation. God's temple is the whole earth. That was the goal of the meeting. If Adam and Eve had fulfilled what He commanded them to do, we would have gone from this to this. But of course we didn't. We, we uh, sinned and the result was curse. So God has, through His redemptive plan, brought about a new covenant head in Christ who has already been raised. And He is now in process of redeeming a new human race that will fill the earth and subdue it as God originally commanded us in the beginning. 
Uh, now, we're going to look at some of this in two weeks when we talk about uh, Eden, Canaan, and the new creation. So there'll be some passages that uh, I won't get into today because I'll be waiting on a couple of weeks to bring those out. But there's one passage that I thought would be fitting for today to look at, and that's Romans again, Romans 8, verses 18 to 25 on this issue of Christ bringing the cultural mandate to fulfillment. So back in Romans, Romans 8, notice Paul's argument here. I'll just go through and read the passage and then I'll uh, come back and just make a couple of observations. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So Paul argues here that creation has been subjected to futility in verse 20. What does that mean? Uh, I think Paul is saying here that creation has been frustrated. Creation was made for a purpose. That purpose was to become the dwelling place of God. And yet, because of man's sin, creation has been frustrated in that purpose. It never did attain to this. Uh, and the result is now creation is groaning, uh, metaphorically speaking, creation is groaning to be set free from this futility. Uh, this frustration to enter into the freedom and the glory of what it was always intended to be. So creation is anticipating something. It's groaning in anticipation of, according to verse 19, the revealing of the sons of God. Now, in what sense would the sons of God, the children of God, those who are destined to inherit the new creation, in what sense is Paul speaking of their being revealed? Uh, imagine it this way. Could you walk down the street today, a busy street where lots of people are walking, and just looking at those people walking down the street, could you say, oh, there's a son of God, there's a son of God, there's one. No, you, you can't just by looking at anyone. We, as, as believers in Christ, we look just the same as everyone else, and much of our lives looks the same as everyone else. Uh, hopefully there are some differences, but it, just in terms of everyday experience, just seeing someone out there, you can't tell is that person a son of God? So at what point will it be clearly revealed who the sons of God are and who are not? Well, at the resurrection. When we are raised from the dead unto glory, that will be the open manifestation before the world that we are the sons of God. Creation is longing for that day to come. Why? Why does creation long for the revealing of the sons of God? Or as Paul says in verse 23, the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. It's because the resurrection of believers will ultimately result in the renewal of creation itself. The resurrection of believers will ultimately result in the renewal of creation itself. If you want an extended biblical argument on that, that very point, I want you to read Lee's dissertation uh, he's got it in his office over here. Just go ask him to borrow it. You can read it or you can get it online, I think. Um, but just a very good biblical argument of, of that central point that the resurrection of believers, which is, which is itself grounded in our justification, will result in the renewal of creation. Now, Peter Gentry has put it this way. I think it's a very good way to think about it. In the beginning, God created a place first, and then he created people to populate it. But in the new creation, God is doing the same thing in reverse order. He's creating a people first, and then He's going to create a place for them to dwell in. So that's why creation groans. 
because once the people are complete and unbelievers have been judged and, and removed from creation, at that point, creation itself becomes new, a new heaven and a new earth. And so the bottom line here of what Paul is saying, I think, is that this, the cultural mandate, will be fulfilled in the end. God has not abandoned this. It will be fulfilled in the end because of Jesus Christ. So the fulfillment then of the cultural mandate will result in the final phase of the kingdom of God. God will have a people dwelling with Him in a place that He has established for them forever. And so in that, in, in that, that place and, and that people, uh, there are still some questions that remain. Who are the people? And then what is the nature of the place? So the next two lessons we're going to look at are going to focus on those two things. Who are the people first? So we're going to talk about the, the question of Israel and the church. How do they relate? Um, how do we see that unfolding throughout the Bible? And then the place itself. Uh, what about the, the land that was promised? Uh, how does that fit into the, the overall story? So th that's going to form the, the next two lessons we look at as we finish out this study. But we do have plenty of time right now if anybody has any questions. And if nobody has questions, we also have time to go to the bathroom and other things. Yes? The argument you brought out earlier that some people make that Adam is, you know, I guess, figurative, so to speak. I, I just, are, are these biblical theologians that are doing this? Because, I mean, you know, he, he lived a certain amount of years just like everybody else did on all your genealogies. I just don't you know, see how they can successfully try to make that argument. Okay, so the question is, who are the ones saying that Adam's not a real person? Um, uh, are you, you familiar with this organization called Biologos? You ever heard of them? Uh, it's, a, it's a group that is committed to the reconciliation of Christian theology and Darwinian evolution. Uh, and so they have a lot of... of uh, scholars who will come on and make videos for them and present conferences and so forth where, where they make arguments for how these two things should be viewed as compatible. So uh, the, the guy who started that is actually the guy, I, I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but he's, he's the man who mapped the human genome. Help me, science guy. Francis Collins, yes. Uh, he, he is a professing Christian believer, uh, but his theology is a little bit weird in this area. Uh, and I think, it's, I think that he's collected around him uh, others who have similar weird views on this kind of thing. Uh, I, I doubt that they would call themselves inerrantists on the Bible. They, they probably have a different view of biblical authority to begin with, and thus that re results in a different way of approaching the Bible, interpreting the Bible. But the funny thing is they'll, they'll get people to do videos for them who don't actually agree with them on the point of Adam, because I know Bruce Waltke has done some things for them. And Bruce Waltke is an Old Testament scholar who... who is comfortable with Darwinian evolution, but Bruce Walke believes in a historical Adam, uh, as do a number of other scholars, I believe, who've worked with them. So, um, so there's, there's a whole spectrum, I guess you could say, of uh, views here. And I think drawing a line where Adam is a historical person is an important line to draw because you lose so many things about the story of the Bible if Adam's not historical. If there's not a historical fall, into sin, then why are we sinners to begin with? What has happened to it? If the, the evolutionary story is, a, is one of gradual progress toward better and better and better things, but the biblical story is one of a fall from a great height. Those are two very different stories. And so this is why I think we, we need to be careful with how far we, we take uh, the scientific uh, issues into our understanding of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Bill. Uh, in the passage of Romans five, where it says that um, Adam's sin uh, leads to condemnation for all men. Yes. And um, Christ's work leads to um, redemption for all men. Uh, if we believe that in Adam all sin. 
why do we not cling to universalism? It's a good question. Um, Romans 5, as Bill's pointing out, has been appealed to as teaching universalism or the salvation of all people in the end. Uh, so if you, if you look again at verse 18, therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. And so the, the question is, if, if the one clearly refers to all people universally, why doesn't the other also refer to all people universally? And there's several answers to that. Um, number one would be the broader context of Paul's teaching where he clearly lays out that there will be a final judgment, there will be condemnation for some at least. Uh, the second argument I would make is that in the very verse that precedes it, Paul has already placed a qualification on those who are redeemed when he says, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So, so there he's limiting it to those who receive the abundance of grace. And uh, the reason I think he speaks in universal terms there in verse 18 is because, because Christ actually is the Savior of humanity. He's the Savior of all nations. Uh, anyone who's going to be saved is going to be saved through Christ. But his, his point is laying out that, that covenantally we are either in Adam or in Christ. So when, when Paul says uh, Christ's one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men, uh, I think what that means is all men in Christ, all men who are covenant, covenantally related to God through Christ. So I think contextually in the immediate context and more broadly in the in the larger teaching of Romans and all of Paul's writings, it becomes clear he's not a universalist. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Michael. Um, do you think there's anything wrong with um, holding to the belief that because we are under Adam federally, it's because we are under him biologically at first? And I, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, how does that work with Christ being our federal head? And, Okay, so the question is, did you ask, do I think that there's anything wrong yeah, with like, that? Um, the reason why we are under Adam in yes. federal sense is because we are under him in a biological sense. Yeah, so the question is, are we, are we covenantally related to Adam because we're biologically his descendants? Right. I think yes, I think that's right. I think the, the unity of the human race, that's another reason he must be a historical figure. The unity of the human race in him is what determines our equal standing in judgment before God. So yes, uh, there's a biological or physical relation there, but <coughs> redemption results from a spiritual union uh, that we have with Christ through faith. So, so there's a different way of relating to it, our new covenant head. Yeah, that's a good question too. How does Jesus then escape the condemnation since he too is physically descended from Adam? You and Bill Nettles have been colluding this morning about... <laughs> no, <I'm just> uh, <laughs> how does Jesus escape that? I, I have thought about that before. Um, I'm comfortable saying Jesus because he's not, his personhood is not of human origin, but it's divine. He is a divine person who has taken on a human nature. So his, his personhood not being of the human race uh, is what enables him not to participate in the condemnation of humanity. That'd be my, my response. All right, good questions. Also, also because of the virgin birth. Yes, yes, as well. The virgin birth secures the, the unique deity and humanity of Christ, divine person, but with a complete human nature. Good point. All right, well, we're about out of time then, so thanks for your attention and your questions. We'll look then next week at Israel and the church.